Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of TBR. I'm George Bins, and the topic this evening is the state of the city. And who better to tell us all about it than Brendan Sweeney, City Councilor at Large. Welcome, Brendan. Thanks, George. Good to be here. So there's a lot going on in the city. Uh, some of it is seems to be on the back burner, and some of it is red hot and screaming. And we've got lots of issues. And I guess where I'd like to start is uh, the Bass River overlay was mm. really hot this past summer and last spring. And uh, it all of a sudden went comatose. And uh, then it got resurrected with uh, the problem with the bridges. Mm. So where does that stand right now? Really? Yeah. So I'm glad that you brought that up. It was, uh, as you mentioned, last summer and prior, there had been discussions about potentially rezoning the Bass River area. Yeah. As you know, that area now is entirely zoned essentially industrial. Yeah. And there was talk about how do we bring in residential, commercial, what the mix would be, uh, potential height restrictions, uh, concerns about proximity to the river. Um, and essentially the factor that has led to those discussions being put on the back burner, as you mentioned, was the closure of the Hall Whitaker Bridge. Um, obviously the bridge situation is frustrating. I think the one silver lining is that it will give us a little more time as a community to discuss what we would like to see on the Bass River in the event that that's redeveloped. And it would also give the community some time to measure the effects of the development that we've seen on Rantoul Street in recent years, especially what the ultimate traffic impact is. That was probably the biggest concern that I had when we were originally discussing some potential proposals for how to rezone the Bass River is with the Depot 2 project not yet completed, what would the traffic impact be in the area that runs right up, right on the Bass River now? Yeah. Um, so my understanding based on what the mayor has communicated to the city council is that any potential rezoning proposal for the Bass River is on hold until the bridge situation is resolved. Uh, so that's where we stand now for those that are interested. Um, but that being said, at some point I expect the conversation will resurface and we'll talk about whether or not to rezone the Bass River, what the impacts would be on Goat Hill, on Ryle side. Uh, and so I would encourage folks to to not completely forget about that matter so that we can continue to receive input. Uh, we had a handful of neighborhood meetings in Ryle side, in Goat Hill. Uh, and it's important that we are intentional when planning, whether it's downtown or citywide, uh, for any potential redevelopment. Well, that's the part of the thing that bothers me yeah, we've got a maybe a four-year hiatus while they put in a temporary uh, bridge for the uh, mm -hmm. going over Bridge Street. But I don't see anything happening about that. And this is the time when these kind of discussions ought to be going on and very actively th thrashing out what do we really want to happen. Uh, to my perspective, Bass River overlay should have been the first thing done because it's the closest to the railroad station. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this is being driven by the uh, the governor of the state pushing uh, TOD, Transient Oriented Development. Yeah. And that would be an ideal place to implement TOD because you're literally within walking distance of the station. And it makes transportation in and out of Boston or going north even, uh, very, mm -hmm. very accommodating. But all of a sudden this thing goes quiet and everybody sits around doing nothing for four years and all of a sudden, oh, we got to fix this problem. And it's got to be an instant solution. And uh, I think, as you mentioned, the several meetings that were uh, had with the different groups in town different areas pointed out that they have different goals for what this ought to do mm -hmm. and different requirements and they didn't get sorted out with the t these town meetings um, and it's not going to be an easy solution to how do we balance this without a clear definition of what are we doing yep. so I'm bothered that well we're going to work this out later and uh, all of a sudden, 
Well, I will just say that that doesn't mean that this planning for any potential redevelopment. And obviously, you don't want plans to come top down. I want to make sure, especially as a council at large representing the whole city, yeah. that we are taking constituent input and forming plans for any potential redevelopment accordingly and not kind of top down telling people this is what we're going to do, which I think that was probably the number one thing I heard when we met in Ryleside last summer to discuss plans for the Bass River is folks felt like they didn't really have input and that they were receiving from the administration a plan for development that well, that's Rand Sewell Street all over again. Yeah, and so that's the other thing that I, I've already alluded to, but is really important to emphasize is that we haven't yet fully felt the impacts of the development on Rantoul Street no. because there is still building ongoing, yep. and you know there is going to be another development um, where the Meineke lot, that property, is. My understanding is that the planning board had a meeting on Tuesday night. It's a by right development. There's nothing that they can do yeah. to stop it so long as it meets the current zoning code, which, as I know we're going to discuss, is probably the biggest thing we have going on in the city right now is discussing um, changes to the current zoning ordinance and what that would mean for the future of development. Uh, but going back to Bass River and the bridge, it's definitely not on the back burner in the sense that everybody's going to forget about it. We're still looking, especially the city council, we're looking as we go into this conversation about rewriting the zoning ordinance, or at least amending it, what does that mean holistically for the city of Beverly if we are to limit development in certain areas? Are there areas we would want to encourage development where so far there hasn't been as much growth? Uh, obviously, one thing that makes Beverly unique is that while we do have a vibrant downtown, the exterior neighborhoods of our city are much more residential, which you yeah. don't see in Lynn or Salem or some of the cities closer to Boston. Mm -hmm. So that's obviously something that we want to preserve. Uh, but just to close the loop on the bridge, the fact of the matter is that that is the immediate pressing issue for the neighborhood. And really for the city, in my mind, I know the residents, I live downtown, so I probably feel the impact more so than residents, definitely not more than the residents of Rileside, but maybe mm -hmm. that those in like North Beverly or Beverly Farms would. But I still think it's very important that the entire city focus on the issue of the bridge because of how much of it, essentially a major throughway it is for folks getting yeah. from downtown out to the highway and then for folks in Ryle side connecting with the rest of the city. And so yeah. that's why we're not completely putting Bass River in out of mind, essentially. It's still something to consider within the long-term plan of yeah. how to potentially redevelop areas of the city. But the immediate pressing concern is making sure that we have a permanent solution yeah. for the bridge. And that's... It's what the mayor's communicated, and obviously that's my yeah, number one priority, too. The solution for the bridge is uh, obviously a long-term process, whether it's 13 yep. years before we get the final bridges installed. Uh, that bothers me still to this day, because I see these videos on uh, YouTube and so forth of uh, China puts a new bridge in over the weekend, you know, and they put up a brand new building in 30 days. So um, the difference between what is doable and what I hear is happening, I think is frustrating to me and it's frustrating to a lot of people. Why is this taking so long? Yeah, so let's let's address that. Uh, and I, I've been present at the meetings that we've had. We had one at the high school, another at Ayers yeah. uh, Elementary School a few weeks ago to discuss the first one was with MassDOT at the high school, and yeah. it, that is really what needs to be emphasized here is that the process works in that MassDOT, as in the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, the state agency, just mm -hmm. for those who don't know the acronym, is really the driver in the replacement of both the Hall Whitaker Bridge and the eventual replacement of the Kernwood Bridge, yeah. in that these bridges are designed by those state agencies. They're the ones that submit the proposals to the federal government and the state itself is financing with federal money the construction of those two bridges. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing that my understanding is that the mayor and Commissioner Collins have been in constant contact with officials at MassDOT, really trying to emphasize the needs of the city, especially, uh, I don't know if you were at the meeting on last month about uh, at the high school with the MassDOT officials where they proposed building a temporary bridge, then redoing the Kernwood, then taking down the temporary bridge, and then redoing the Hall Whitaker over the span of like 14 years, which obviously yeah. 
really doesn't meet the needs of the residents of Rileside, who only a few months in have already felt the increase in traffic and you know real concerns about safety. Yeah. Uh, so that's where the mayor and Commissioner Collins have really been pushing to make sure that if we can redo the bridge without the need for a temporary bridge that is built only to then be torn down, and that would expedite the timeline, then that's obviously the preference of the city. Yeah. The concern, the challenge, I'll say, is that MassDOT has to finalize a plan before they can submit anything to the federal yeah. officials, namely the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, and the Coast Guard. Those permitting processes are incredibly cumbersome, and that's where I hope that the city, you know, I'll, I'm certainly happy to assist in the advocacy, can work with our federal delegation, our two senators and our representative in Congress to push the urgency of this situation and ideally help expedite the final plan that the city of Beverly is able to create with MassDOT to expedite that through the federal permitting process. Yeah. So it's frustrating. I've been frustrated. Uh, that's the nature of having a project that cuts through all three levels, levels of government local, state, and federal, uh, but that's where things stand at the moment. And I think that's part of the problem that uh, the real details of what's happening mm -hmm. aren't really showing up. Uh, you just get dribs and drabs in the paper, and uh, from my experience, I'm, I was part of the government's program send the big kids to camp routine, and uh, I'm an MOS 1331, I'm a combat engineer. Yep. Yep. So, <clears throat> to my way of thinking is, we should have a Bailey Bridge across the whole, whole Whitaker by the end of the week. That's what it was designed to do, and that's the, what it's capable of doing. And uh, I've had some discussions with uh, Commissioner Collins, mm -hmm. and uh, he keeps alluding to permitting processes and satisfying the Coast Guard and having to put in some... Uh, pilings to support it well if you have to get then to that sort of thing put in a floating bridge and the uh, battalion I was assigned to our bridge company was a floating bridge company mm. and those things can go up in the matter of a week so there are to my way of thinking almost instant solutions that get us to a functioning community again Yep, and Obviously, there's a lot of other people that are smarter than me that know how to do this faster and quicker. And I think what needs to happen is some sort of detailed statement of, okay, this is what the process is. Mm. It's difficult because. And I don't think too many people are hearing that story. I'm at least, yeah. at least not hearing so it. So that's where it's frustrating. I'm not an engineer. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be frustrating for me as an elected official, somebody that represents the neighborhood, when you hear, oh, it's, you know, permitting or whatever other issue that really hasn't been clearly explained. Yeah. MassDOT did try to map out the timeline, and their biggest hurdle is essentially that they have been informed by the federal agencies, and this is why I think it's so important that we push our federal elected officials, that the timeline for permitting for the EPA and then for the Coast Guard are independent of each other year and a half, two year timelines. And mm. I don't really understand why the permitting process takes that long. I, I do appreciate the environmental concerns. Um, given that we're a coastal community, that's yeah. something that we're all acutely oh, yeah. aware of in Beverly. Um, I would like to hear more information. And it's challenging when MassDOT is the only other outside agency that we've come to speak to the city, and I am yeah. grateful that they were willing to do so. Yeah. And they're essentially relaying secondhand, here's what the federal government has told us yeah. will be the permitting issues that we'll run into in trying to design a bridge that would facilitate a long-term solution. Yeah. So, that's so I can understand the, the permitting process on a long-term solution type mm. of bridge. But on something that we re need to replace instantly to get the community rolling again, um, not sure. And again, my work experience is dealing with paper problems yep. and expediting paper problems kind of thing. And just, I think I'm probably sharing the same frustration as everybody else when you hear that it's a permitting process. 
Go right the fuck down. This will get beeped if I go much further. So I, I agree with you. And what I'll say is that I know the mayor, Representative Paracella, Senator Lovely, Councilor Rotundo, who has done an incredible amount of work yeah. on this specific issue, have been advocating for solutions to address this matter as quickly as possible, in addition to looking at what the long-term solution might be. Yeah. So they, they certainly haven't ruled anything out, and yeah. that's where I stayed in touch with those yeah. officials that I just listed and Commissioner Collins about what can we do to help ease the burden that this neighborhood has had to bear in yeah. the form of increased traffic. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a, an yeah, answer no, at this you, time, you but it's something answers. that we need to keep pushing. Yeah. And, and just uh, because we say we run up against issues that, while there's a permitting timeline that we have to go through, that doesn't mean that we can't ask questions and continue to push. Well, what can we do still working within the rules to facilitate a solution for a neighborhood that needs one. Well, change the rules where it's necessary to make it happen. Uh, I hate to keep harping on this one subject, but again, I can remember in my younger days mm -hmm. that we had a hurricane blow through the New England area, took out a bridge on I-95, and they had a Bailey Bridge across that gap rather quickly. I don't know the exact timeline, but they had a Bailey Bridge supporting this particular section of I-95 in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't take 13 years to get the damn thing in place. So, yeah, well, I mean, that's what's frustrated me. Yeah. Is you, but anyway, see, you see the emergency response and you ask, why can't that yeah, same yeah. level of urgency be applied to our situation here in Beverly? Yeah. And uh, so I think there's a big issue that uh, gets across, like you said, several different mm -hmm. levels of government. And uh, I just, I guess everybody's got to call uh, Seth Moulton, our congressman, to get something started. Uh, yeah, and that's, uh, I know those communications have been initiated, and that's something that I continue, plan to continue to push. The so. other thing that seems to be getting uh, a lot of interest is uh, that five-story building on Cabot Street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right in my neck of the woods. I live on Federal Street, so. So... Um, yeah, there's going to be a lot of turmoil as that building goes up, as they make adjustments on the streets, as they bring in bits and pieces of the construction project. Um, but the question comes up of, uh, is that going to be the only five-story building on Cabot Street? Or is that going to, Cabot Street going to become uh, a reproduction of Ant Rantoul Street? And that's, that's now up to the council. And so... I have been frustrated with that project because one concern of mine, especially being a resident of Federal Street, which cuts in between Cabot and Rantoul yeah. and, you know, operating out of downtown yeah. there, I am concerned that we don't have, especially once this project goes in, there will be a lack of adequate public parking yeah. to help facilitate activity on Cabot Street. And yeah. the two big activities that I think of why folks come in from out of town to spend time on Cabot Street is to go to the theaters, which we were fortunate to have multiple in that vicinity, yeah. and to shop at our local businesses, which has been a priority of mine in working with groups like the Beverly Chamber of Commerce and Beverly Main Streets to help facilitate business activity coming out of the pandemic. It's a real asset that we have a vibrant Main Street on Cabot. And so my concern, and unfortunately it's the project as proposed which would essentially occupy the family dollar, or now the former side of the family dollar as they've gone out of business, and the two parking lots behind it, is that those parking lots, while they were privately owned, under an arrangement with the city, essentially operated as public parking. Yeah. And so I'm very concerned about the loss of parking there. I'm glad that we recently approved a grant from the state at our city council meeting on Monday to help facilitate a parking plan, which I think is desperately needed, that we need to take a holistic look at what what we can do to help either create or make more readily available parking that already exists on Cabot. Um, but with regards to zoning, I'm optimistic that this is the last five-story development that we see on Cabot Street because I do not want Cabot to become essentially a clone of Rantoul given that it does have a, a different character as more of a Main Street walkable part of our downtown mm -hmm. as opposed to Rantoul, which has certainly been revitalized for the better, but 
the buildings there are quite large and are not what I would like to see continue in Beverly. And so what the mayor's proposed, originally Councillor St. Hilaire first proposed limiting development to three stories across the city. And we had a very good dialogue with residents and I you know, appreciate anybody listening who took the time to come and talk to the council when we held that forum about what we want to see in Beverly going forward. And we heard a mix of folks who were concerned about limiting development to three stories across the city and others who said, well, even if that's not the solution, we do need to do something proactively to limit five, six, seven story growth especially on Cabot and elsewhere in the city. And so what the mayor's proposed and what the city council is going to review at the planning board next month is a proposal that would limit development to five stories on Rantoul, four stories on Cabot Street, and essentially three stories elsewhere in the city. Um, I think that's a great framework for us to work off of. I would not want to see development any higher than four stories on Cabot Street, so I'm glad that this proposal mm -hmm. coming from the mayor's office would set that limit. And I think that would provide a good balance where we're not limiting the potential for future development, especially downtown. But what we are saying is here's the parameters of the community that Beverly sees itself as far as development goes. We're appreciative of the asset that our downtown is, and we don't want to limit growth there. But Cabot Street is not intended to be a corridor of five, six, seven-story apartment buildings. It's intended to be a walkable main street with small businesses, with theaters that folks from in and out of side of the city can enjoy. And then, as I mentioned earlier in our conversation, the residential corners of Beverly that really make us unique from some of the other cities right in the ring of Boston mm -hmm. need to be preserved. And so yeah. this would essentially preserve that residential character. Well, you mentioned early on that one of the issues with uh, this uh, five-story building is it's being um, essentially developed by right yeah. because that's what the code says you can do in the city and the parking uh, that the city has been using is private property yeah which and again it can be uh, modified at the will of the owner that's hey that's the way the free system works yeah exactly it's the market <laughs> so, the, so the question now becomes one of uh, okay we're going to lose a bunch of parking spaces and uh yeah, we go, go through the, the arithmetic and say, well, even at a, at a big show at both Markham and uh, the Cabot Theater, um, there isn't going to be a problem with uh, parking because we can handle it fine. But as we talk about more and more development along uh, Cabot Street, the implications are that yeah, we're going to have to have more parking available if you want to bring in people from we do. The That's an yeah. Where are you going to get it, mm -hmm. kind of thing? Or the other option is, do we set up a perimeter parking facility someplace, Heard Field, Heard Stadium, or something like that, and run a shuttle service around the city? And that's one of my concerns with a lot of this development on uh, Rantoul Street is uh, you're not within walking distance of a market. Or yeah, especially with the loss of the family dollar now. That yeah. was, you know, as somebody who lived downtown, that would, I yeah. frequented that if I needed to get groceries in walking so distance. that's, I think, part of the issue is, yeah, it's all right to talk about just the height of the buildings, but it has to be an integrated system that yeah. everything works together. And parking is uh, last thought. I mean, the, the issues we've gone through with uh, the Boathouse Restaurant... Yeah, and on uh, the old uh, McDonald's property, uh, points out that yeah, it's nice to have a nice restaurant right on the the water, but restaurants draw people. People come in cars. Where do you put them? And the neighbors were up in arms. Yeah, and the city we have been trying to work on a solution for that particular area where essentially Cabot and Rantoul intersect yeah. right before the Salem Bridge, of where we could find space that could be used for additional parking. Uh, on the point about the shuttle, I, it's my understanding the restaurant's going to end up trying to run something like that. We'll see how successful it is. It's certainly an asset to have a waterfront restaurant. Oh, but yeah. the concern which I have for that area and for the city as a whole is that we, especially when you think about our business community and what we offer on uh, with the theaters and other entertainment venues, is that 
and I was actually just talking to somebody this morning about this, we're essentially in competition with cities like Salem, Gloucester, Rockport, Newburyport that have these historic downtowns with where folks from the region or New Hampshire or Boston or close by that want to come to the North Shore and spend the day, where they'll ultimately go. And if they know that they're coming from out of Beverly, parking's restricted, we could potentially lose their business for them exactly. saying, well, I'll spend the day somewhere else in Gloucester yeah. or Rockport or Newburyport. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's very important that we keep in mind to have a vibrant downtown, you need to attract daytime visitors from out of town, especially on the weekends. And if they don't have anywhere to park, or if even folks from like North Beverly coming in downtown don't have anywhere to park, mm. then they're not going to spend their time at the theater patronizing the local businesses, going to the coffee shop, the restaurants, you know, things that, for me, I live downtown, I can walk to. Folks from the uh, edge of town, yeah. from the farms, from North Beverly, they have to drive. Um, so that's my concern, is that if we are too restrictive in... You know, essentially being too ambitious with development in areas of downtown yeah. without sufficient parking that we're actually going to hurt activity at our businesses, exactly. at the restaurant. Yeah. And because I'm, I'm not convinced the shuttle system, I think, is nice in theory. We'll see how it is in practice. But I know most folks would rather be able to park within walking distance, get out of their car and go to the theater or go yeah. to the restaurant. So yeah. we, we should be looking to facilitate that. Yeah, th there's a fundamental problem with... Uh public transportation. Mm -hmm. It's the time lag between the next time the train comes by or the bus comes by yeah. and you're standing in the cold, in the rain or something waiting for this thing to show up. And uh, and one thing I'll say, uh, I actually, I was working in Boston for the past four years or so, as I mentioned. I mm -hmm. recently started a position in the town of Boxford as their assistant town administrator. I started over the summer. But when I was working in Boston, I took the commuter rail in and out of the city every day and it was great. You know, it was uh, very efficient that I could walk from my downtown apartment to the train station, get on the train, and then walk from North Station to the State House. But I still had a car that I utilized for getting to the grocery store, for going yeah. out of town. You know, my parents live in Ipswich. Anytime I visited them, I would drive yeah. to their house. And uh, my wife worked works at a school in Lynn. She still does. She has to drive to work given yeah. the proximity of the school that's on the edge of the city. So that's the one thing to keep in mind is that it's very important that we look at alternative forms of transportation, especially given that we have multiple commuter rail stations. Yeah. We should be encouraging biking. We should be encouraging walking. But there's still going to be folks that if they can bike and walk to work, they might still need a car. Oh, yeah. Even if they don't use it as much, which is good, they'll need to park it somewhere for when they need it. So yeah. that's it's something to keep in mind. It's a total solution. And mm -hmm. uh, there's no instant answer, as we found out. And uh, we spent a half an hour looking for one and. I don't yeah, think if we, if we, I would love it if we could come out of this show with answers. Uh, yeah, so, you know, uh, so we'll just we'll keep the conversation going, and we'll I have encourage to do folks have to more discussions. And mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And as I indicated uh, many times, after the uh, credits at the end of the show, there's my email address. If you've got an opinion you'd like to share with us, uh, we'll make the room for you at the table here. So think about joining us some night. And thanks you again, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us, and we'll see you next time. And one quick thing I want to note, if I have a second here, uh, for folks that are interested in being a part of the conversation about the future of zoning and planning in the city, that proposal that George and I were talking about will be discussed by both the city council and the planning board at our December 5th meeting, which is a Monday. So please mark it on your calendars. Uh, if you can't make it, don't hesitate to email or call me. I'd love to hear your input, as this is a very important decision that'll dictate what the future of development in Beverly looks like. So okay. please you know, continue to stay engaged.